what God has done. How awesome his works in man's behalf. He turned the sea into dry land. They passed through the waters on foot. Come, let us rejoice in him. He rules forever by his power. His eyes watch the nations. Let not the rebellious rise up against him. Praise our God, O peoples. Let the sound of his praise be heard. He has preserved our lives and kept our feet from slipping. For you, O God, tested us. You refined us like silver. You brought us into prison and laid burdens on our backs. You let men ride over our heads. We went through fire and water. But you brought us to a place of abundance. I will come to your temple with burnt offerings and fulfill my vows to you. Vows my lips promised and my mouth spoke when I was in trouble. I will sacrifice fat animals to you and an offering of rams. I will offer bulls and goats. Come and listen, all you who fear God. Let me tell you what he has done for me. I cried out to him with my mouth. His praise was on my tongue. If I had cherished sin in my heart, the Lord would not have listened. But God has surely listened and heard my voice in prayer. Praise be to God, who has not rejected my prayer or withheld its love from me. And is a children's church. Okay. Children, you are dismissed. I'll take it up there. Good morning. morning. Let's start with prayer. Father, thank you for this beautiful day. Thank you for the opportunity to come and freely worship you. We thank you for your word. We thank you for the truth that is found there, Father, and that we can always count on it. Help us to listen to your words and apply them to our hearts and to our actions. Help us to be the hands and feet to this world so that others will come to know Jesus Christ. Bless this service today, Father, and have your spirit in this place. For it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. So today's sermon is called Putting the Pieces Together, Building Families. And we're kind of building on some of the things that we've talked about before. We talked previously about the roles and responsibility of each and every family member, that it's important not only to participate and to do your proper role, whether you're a child or whether you're a dad or a mother or a spouse, whatever that may be. God has designs and rules, and we can go to His Word and find out what those are. If we try to live by man's laws, sometimes we find out that they're so much different than what God's laws are. But he has definitions for marriage, for family, for relationships, and love. And last week we talked a lot about love. When each family member realizes and accepts their role, then we can start building families. From families we can start building churches. From churches then we can reach this world and start building this world to draw them back to God. Pieces start fitting together. They work together. Regardless of what your role is, whether it's father, husband, wife, mother, child, or sibling, we need to obey and live by God's rules and designs. We have to be committed to Him, to His service, not our service. So that means so many times we've got to get rid of the I factor out of it, doesn't it? If we do that, not only will there be peace and harmony in our own homes, but then we can start becoming an effective extended family, a church for God. We can do the things that He has called us to do. Jesus left this earth not just to leave and to abandon us, but to send the Holy Spirit to empower us to be His hands and feet to this world. And we can't do that unless we are a family of God, one family united. Putting the pieces together. So how do we do that? Well, let's look at Scripture. Exodus 16.4 says this, Then the Lord said to Moses, I will rain down bread from heaven for you, The people are to go out each day and gather enough for that day. In this way I will test them and see whether they will follow my instructions. We seem to forget because we think it's all about us, especially here in the United States. The opportunities that we have are wonderful. The American dream is wonderful. As long as we don't lose focus of we wouldn't even have that dream if God did not love us enough and provide for us. And He provides for us every single day and we take it for granted because the sun comes up every day. We have oxygen to breathe. We live in a a land where we have freedom. We even take that for, for granted. God is the total reason that you exist. He is God. 
We're not God. We're not in control of anything. Only by His grace do we have what we have. We think we can control and do everything, but the exact opposite is true. Just let Him let us know by one day taking oxygen away and see what will happen. We can't by our own means produce it. We wouldn't have enough time to figure it out even if we thought we were that smart. We would die within a matter of minutes without oxygen. Only by God's grace do we have it. We're not in control of anything. By His blessings, we do have so much because He loves His children. It's all about love. The Bible from cover to cover is about God's love for mankind. He created us and He rains down the things that we need, the provisions that we need for life. And He also wants to rain so much more. He wants to rain blessings. But blessings don't come if we're not obedient that much. God should probably rain down fire and judgment, shouldn't He? But He doesn't. He rains down love. Because He doesn't want anyone to not come to the saving knowledge of Jesus Christ. He doesn't want one of His children to die from this earth and not know Him as their Father. That's the kind of love that we have. And we know that that love is always going to be there. God provides for us because He loves us. And then He wants to pour out His blessings upon us if we'll just live the way that we should live. All throughout the Bible, if you look and if you follow His commands, He not only will bless you, but He will bless your entire family. He's all about families. So I grew up in Florida. I know what rain is like. You can kind of set your clock by it in the summer times especially. Every afternoon there's going to be a thunder shower. It's not only going to rain, but it's going to come down in buckets. That's just what it does. Why? Well... I don't know why, but I can relate it to it a little bit and see what it does. About 2.30 in the afternoon on a hot summer day, all of a sudden out of nowhere, because it's beautiful skies, here come all these clouds come rushing in. There's thunder and lightning, and you better go inside or have a heavy-duty umbrella because it's going to come down. And it's going to rain buckets for about 30 minutes to maybe an hour. And then guess what? The clouds are going to disappear again, and it's going to be a nice sunny afternoon. It's just the way it works. And God's love is so much the same way. He provides that rain that we need daily in our lives. He pours out the things that we need. He doesn't take them from us. He brings about every single day the oxygen that we need. The rotation of the earth. The sun comes up, we can count on it. He loves His children. He made this environment for us to love. And when He made it, it was perfect. But we still live in a beautiful environment even though it's tarnished by sin. How much God loves His children... Well, what that rain does is it brings nourishment that the state needs, that the grass needs, the plants need, everything else. Without that rain, the sun would burn them up. Literally burn them up. Life would not be life, but it instead would be dead. Everything would wither and die. So God gives us exactly what He needs, and He pours it out. And then afterwards, not only does it go away, but the heat of the day, you're so hot and sweaty and it's just miserable, all of a sudden it's a nice evening. Because God has rained down what you need. He has provided for you. He loves you so much that not only does He provide, but you have the cool blessings of the evening where He's poured out His love on you all day. We just have to realize that. We have to accept that know that He's in control. It's not about us. It's about Him, about His story. God's provisions can always be counted on. They come quickly. We don't know exactly where they come from from time to time, but He gives them to us because He loves us, plain and simple. And He gives us not only what we need to restore us and give us life, but He rains down so many more blessings if we'll just be obedient to Him. Yet what do we do? We fail to see that. We fail to trust Him. We fail to understand that He is God alone. We think that we bring about the things under our own power and might. At times, not only do we only doubt, but we become belligerent about it. God is God. He demands our love. He demands our respect. Just thank goodness that we know a loving God. He's serious about it, though. He's serious about us obeying His commands. He's not going to be trampled on. He's not going to allow us to have other gods before Him. He deserves our respect and our love because He is who He is. We would not even exist if He didn't create us. If you go down further in that passage in Exodus 16, verse 20, here's what happens though. However, and I've said that word before, but and however, the same thing. 
complete reversal to whatever you've just said. And you can't stand it as an earthly father. How do you think God feels when he gives his commands being who he is, his sovereignty? When I tell my son to go do this and he says, but, I'm like, oh, here it comes again. He doesn't hear a word I say. He's not going to listen to me because he thinks his needs are more important. Why am I even speaking? He's just going to do the exact opposite. Isn't that exactly what we're saying to God? It says, however, some of them paid no attention to Moses. They kept part of it until morning, but it was full of maggots and began to smell. So Moses was angry with them. Anytime we disobey, there's punishment. In this case, maybe God should have rained down fire, but He didn't. He continued to feed them because that's what He said He would do. That's God. You can count on His blessings. But what He did do was the next morning it was full of maggots. That was not... Food doesn't spoil in 24 hours, or not even 24 hours, but 8 to 10 hours. He brought about the destruction of the food to show them that He was God. He brought about punishment. But wow, that punishment could have been a lot more severe, couldn't it? Because He tests His children to see if they're going to be faithful. He loves His children. He trains them if they'll just listen and be obedient. But none of them pay, some of them paid no attention at all. I don't know about you, but what I hear from that verse is, whatever, God, right? I hate that. Whatever. That's worse than but. Because what they're letting you know is they completely disrespect you. They're throwing it up in your face. Well, I know what you said and everything, but whatever. Got it? That's what they said to Him. God was supplying their needs. They were in a desert. How were they going to make food for themselves? I don't know how. I wouldn't want to be in that case. And He had just done mighty, wondrous works. They had seen the power of God. They had seen the waters rise up and they walked on dry ground. And then they saw the waters come crashing down and destroy the Egyptians that were chasing them. God gives them everything they need. But how quickly. I think that you know, if I were walking then, there's no way that I could could do that that quickly. But we do that every day of our life, don't we? We forget what God does. Even if there's mighty, wondrous acts, we still forget that He's in control. We try to put ourselves in the position of God. They would have died if He had not provided for them. But then they give Him the whatever. They pay no attention to Him at all. Just disregard what He says totally. Thank you for this, Father, but I'm not going to pay any attention to you because it's all about me. I'm going to do exactly the opposite. But thank God, goodness God doesn't do the opposite. When He tells you He's going to provide for you, when He tells you that if you believe in Jesus Christ, you will be saved. You will be. You have no doubt. You have hope. Hope that surpasses all understanding. But He wants you to be obedient. He gives us grace so many times instead of righteous judgment. If you read on in verse 28, it says, Then the Lord said to Moses, How long will you, in the King James Version says, you people, refuse to keep my commands and my instructions? We fail so many times to realize how much God loves us. We see the problems in this world rather than the blessings. And that's easy to do. We we dwell on the, the negative things rather than on the good things. This came up today and I don't know how to deal with it. This person said this or that about me. I got to get up and work. Whatever the burdens may be of life. But like I said, at least we didn't have to manufacture our own oxygen. At least we didn't have to find a way that we could survive the radiation of the sun. God gives us the cloud coverage and everything that we need to protect us. He loves us. Did that happen by chance? No way would it ever happen by chance. Did it happen just because He wanted to provide for us? Yes, because He loves us. That's why though. He didn't have to provide for us. He doesn't need our love. He doesn't need our companionship. He chose to create us because He wants to have a loving relationship with us. So, what do we need to do? Do we need to be as obedient to His commands? Or do we need to say, um, however God, whatever God, I'm not going to pay you any attention at all. We've got the examples. We've just got to apply them to our own life and not just read them and say, I would never be that way because we're that way every day. And God will continue to love us, continue to forgive us if we'll just be faithful to Him. Focus our heart on Him. So it's a heart factor. Caleb was different than the other spies, Caleb and Joshua, because they wholeheartedly served God. But did that mean that they didn't have the same punishment? They had to wander for 40 years in the desert. And they were obedient to God. 
They didn't grumble or complain, though. They knew that His blessings would come because God promised it. And if they would bear out that punishment, that pain and everything, that His blessings would be so great. And His blessings would be upon their children. I'm sure Caleb got frustrated. We all get frustrated. But he knew that God was faithful. And he knew that His obedience would be poured out not only on him, but his family as well. Families are so important to God. We take it for granted. We take it for granted simply like cutting our finger. If God hadn't designed our blood where it would coagulate, we would bleed to death when we cut our finger. Well, we put that in our own power then and say that I'll just be careful and I won't cut my finger. How many of you have ever had a nosebleed? You did nothing to cause it. Hands. You would all be dead. If God didn't design it where your blood would coagulate, and you explain to me how that would happen with evolution. Oh, I'm fixing to die. I need to pass it on genetically. It's impossible. God loved you and He thought out everything. So when He spoke, it happened and it was perfect. Why? Because He loved you. He doesn't want you to be apart from Him. He wants you to spend eternity with Him. But we can't be satisfied with that or content with it. We think that He doesn't love us. When He doesn't answer prayers, we say, Where are you, God? Are you not listening to me? Because we want our prayers answered the way we want them answered. Then, in our timing. God is God. He's in control. He is faithful and just to take care of you, and He'll hear your prayers. But it doesn't mean they're going to be answered in the way that you want them to be answered. We act like spoiled children so many times. I'm just so thankful that He continues to rain down what we need. Blessings rather than destruction. He chose to love. And He loves families. He loves relationships. They're important to Him. So we learned about families. We learned we had different roles. And what difference that made. And if we train up our children that they will not depart from it. That they will understand. Well, God uses families to build up churches. He uses churches to build up and save this world. So how can we be an effective church if we can't be a family like we want to. Now that doesn't mean, or like he wants us to, that doesn't mean if you're not the perfect family unit that you're, that you're doing wrong. That just means you need to know what your roles are. If you've made mistakes in your life with your kids, change them. Get down on your knees today. Give it to God. Change that. Be the kind of father that you need to be. If you're a child and you're not honoring your parents, then stop today. Give it to God and honor Him. Because if we learn what those relationships are about, then we'll learn more about who God is, His understanding of love. We'll understand and love our brothers and sisters in Christ more. We'll understand that when we grumble and complain, that we're hurting them, that we're dishonoring God, that we're heeding His work. Jesus left not to leave us, but to give us the privilege of carrying on the gospel message. He wants us to be His hands and feet. The structure of families... So important to the church. And that's why we're going to go on tonight and learn a little bit more what we can do as parts of the body. And Paul compares it to a body so that we can see the relevance. That a hand doesn't say to the rest of the body, I'm not going to do what you say. It obeys my mind. It obeys my nervous system, my muscles, and does what I tell it to do. If it doesn't, what good is it? It not only is causing chaos in the body, but I can't accomplish what the body wants to get done. And the same way is true of each and every one of us. And God wants us to be a part of His plan. His plan of redemption and love. So the church should be known by what? By its love, right? Are we? When Jesus was asked by people that were trying to fool Him, to try to trap Him, the church at that time, what the greatest commandment was, He said this in Matthew 22, verses 36 through 39. Teacher, which is the greatest commandment in the law? Jesus replied to them, Love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind. Not part of it, guys. All of it. This is the first and greatest command. And the second is like this. Love your neighbor as yourself. I don't know about you, but I don't want to cause harm to myself. But there are many times when my neighbor, I just want to slap him in the face, right? So we need to get away from that. We need to let God empower us. We need to see through Jesus' eyes. Eyes that were sacrificial love enough to die on the cross for people that were rejecting Him. To see the Father's purpose. That He had to do that to be obedient to bring back a restored relationship. 
So why do we continue to grumble and fight and test God? He's seeing if we will be faithful to His commands or not. 1 John 4.20 says this, Whoever claims to love God yet hates his brother or sister is a liar. For whoever does not love brother and sister whom they have seen cannot love God whom they have not seen. Jesus is clear. If you do not have love for your brother and sister in your family and in your family of God, in your extended family, then you cannot love Him. Plain and simple. It's not debatable. We like to hear, For God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son. But we don't like to hear, Take up your cross and follow Me daily. Same words, same Bible, same God, same Spirit. When parents learn to teach their children, husbands learn to love their wives, wives learn to submit to their husband, children obey and honor their parents, siblings respect each other, then families are starting to act and behave like God intended. They can be used as building blocks rather than stumbling blocks. They can be used in the church to build up the church. They understand authority. They understand their roles. So when they come into church, they don't just lose them because they never understood them at home. That's why it's very crucial to build upon that. And God loves us. He wants a relationship with us. He said it's not good for man to be alone. So He created a mate. And a mate that would have children and offspring to have families. And then they trained up their children meticulously to follow the Lord. And even then they stumbled and fell. God has a function for the family, and that's to help build up church, churches to save communities. 1 Timothy 3.5 says this, If anyone does not know how to manage his own family, how can he take care of God's church? Now, I know you're going to say, well, this is just written to the elders in the church and so forth. It can be applied, period, to all who believe. If you can't manage your own family, and that doesn't mean that you successful because you can't make another person do what you want them to do. But you were obedient to God if you trained them up in the ways of righteousness, if you acted as a loving father should be, if you treated your wife like the spouse that she was, the perfect helpmate that she was intended to be, then your children will see that. Whether they're obedient or not is, is up to them. But they will see it and you're doing what's right in God's eyes and you're following His commands. So it applies to all families, not just elders. If you cannot love and respect family members, how are you going to love and respect church members? If you and your children have no respect for authority, how are you ever going to have respect for God's commands? It's simple. We can apply it to all families. God designed families. He designed them to be building blocks for societies. He works through those families to build the church. It's a biblical principle that's all the way through the Bible. Poor family design, the wrong environment, creates the wrong environment in church. That means that instead of us being known by our love, we're known by our grumblings and stuff. And we're not going to grow. We're not going to build up others. We're not going to be doing God's work. We're going to be instead tearing it down, doing the exact opposite. The New Testament is full of examples of family. In the Old Testament, you see a lot of lineage, the importance of lineage and family ties. But in the New Testament, you see that. Jesus was known when He first started preaching. He said, isn't this the carpenter? Isn't this Mary's son? Isn't that His brothers? He was known by His family. Family units are so important. Just as Jesus came not to destroy the law, but to complete the law, when Jesus came, we see a new emphasis of families. We see the church family. We see God's whole family, His plan, if we look at it. We see how that our own families affect the whole plan of God. That we're all one family in Christ. That we're brothers and sisters. And brothers and sisters shouldn't argue and fight, should they? Brothers and sisters should be obedient of their earthly father. So we should be just as obedient, if not more, to our heavenly father that provides all of our needs. If we have any respect for an earthly father who may or may not do a good job, how much more respect should we have for God who loves us and provides for us? Who's not a wishy-washy God. We can stand on His commandments and stand firm on them. We see the importance in the New Testament of church family. And that's so cool. Because we're not alone. We don't have to struggle. We have God, but we also have our brothers and sisters. I grew up as an only child. I wish that I'd always had brothers and sisters. 
I don't know, some of you may grow up with a bunch of children, siblings, and you did wish you were only child. But God created the family environment so that we could have companionship. It's not good for us to be alone. And we should love our brothers and sisters in Christ. I said before, the defining characteristic of this new family, though, church body, is that they'll be known by their love. Not just love, but love that is sacrificial, love that we talked about last week. Love as Christ loved the church and gave Himself for it. John 13, 34 and 35 says this, A new command I give you. So if you don't understand it, here's the rest of the story. Love one another as I have loved you. So you must love one another. By this, everyone will know that you are my disciples if you love one another. By this, this is going to be your defining characteristic or trait. That as a church family, as a body of believers, others out there who do not know Jesus Christ will recognize this is a church. Why do we know it's a church? Because look at their love that they have for one another. So I ask you, does the world know us that way as a church? Not just this church, all churches. What can we do as a family? Do they know us by our love? Do they know your individual family by their love? Or when you go over their house, you're like, oh goodness, the kids are here too. This is going to be chaotic tonight. I don't want to go to supper at this place. Do they feel the same way when they come to church? Or do they feel loved? We will be known by our love. And we're commanded to do this. Unselfish, wholehearted, genuine, sincere love that keeps no records of wrongs, that doesn't do it for what it gives us, but gives it out of sacrificial love that what we can provide for others. That we love them enough that our own well-being is not as important as their well-being in Christ. That they come to know Jesus Christ as their Savior. We're born physically into the family that we have. Whether it's a good family or not a fam- good family. And that's a bad thing because sin has come into this world. But when we believe in Jesus Christ, we have been adopted into a new family. And we have all the rights and benefits of children of God. Why in the world would we want to tarnish that by grumbling and fighting among ourselves? We're not only bringing ourselves dishonor, but we're bringing our Creator and our God um, shame. Born again, that means that we are rebirthed into a spiritual family of God. Don't forget that. Ephesians 2.19 says this, Consequently, you are no longer foreigners and aliens, but fellow citizens with God's people and members of God's household. If you cherish that thought and remember that thought daily, it will definitely help you in your aspects. If you follow God's command, saturate your time with His words, meditate on Scriptures, if you see the importance of following God, if you love Him wholeheartedly, then this will become easier. Will it become easy? No, I didn't say that. I struggle daily. I know you guys struggle daily. But we've got to see the importance of loving one another. There must be obedience and wholehearted service to following God. He demands it. He is God. Thank goodness that He gives us mercy so many times other than raining down destruction. Exodus 16.28 said, Then the Lord said to Moses, How long will you people refuse to keep my commands and my instructions? I ask you that today. Not because I'm pointing fingers, because whenever I say it, I'm convicting myself just as much as you, if not more. I'm saying, how long will we test God? How long will we not be obedient to His commands? He is testing us to prove whether we will follow His instructions or not. Deuteronomy 13, 3, the second part of the passage says, The Lord your God is testing you to find out whether you love Him. And there it is again with all your heart and with all your soul. Jesus said half-hearted commitment He would spew out of His mouth. He also said that many will come to Him and say, Lord, Lord, and I will say, depart from me, I did not know you. Being a Christian means that you're sold out to Jesus Christ for what He did for you. The love that God so lavishly poured out when Jesus came to die on the cross. And He expects your wholehearted love to love Him with your heart, all of your heart, mind, soul, and spirit. And if we will love Him, we will love others because we'll see that love. And if we love others, especially others in the body of Christ, and guess what? Others will see that. What a wonderful, wonderful thought if we behave like children of God. 
We don't know for sure who wrote Psalm 66, but probably it was David. And he's definitely an example you can look at because he did so many things that you're like, wow, David did these terrible sins. But yet God called him a man after his own heart because he wholeheartedly loved God, even though he made mistakes. Not by his power or might, but by God's grace. And I don't know about you, but that's what I strive for. I want to be known as someone that is after God's heart. So I want to read Psalm 66 again, and that's what we're going to close with, and just think about the words that the psalmist wrote here, whether it was David or not. Shout for joy to God, all the earth. Sing the glory of His name. Make His praise glorious. Say to God, how awesome are your deeds. So great is your power that your enemies cringe before you. All the earth bows down to you. They sing praise to you. They sing the praise of your name. Come and see what God has done. His awesome deeds for mankind. He turned the sea into dry land. They passed through the waters on foot. Come, let us rejoice in Him. He rules forever by His power. His eyes watch the nations. Let not rebellious, let the rebellious rise up against Him. Praise our God, all peoples. Let the sound of His praise be heard. He has preserved our lives and kept our feet from slipping. For you, God, tested us. There it is. You refined us like silver. You brought us into prison and laid burdens on our back. You let people ride over our heads. We went through the fire and water, but you brought us to a place of abundance. I will come to your temple with burnt offerings and fulfill my vows to you. Vow my lips promised, vows my lips promised, and my mouth spoke when I was in trouble. I will sacrifice fat animals to you and an offering of rams. I will offer bulls and goats. Come and hear all you who fear God. Let them tell you, let me tell you what he has done for me. I cried out to him with my mouth. His praise was on my tongue. If I had cherished sin in my heart, the Lord would not have listened. But God has surely listened and heard my prayer. Praise be to God who has not rejected my prayer or withheld his love from me. Let's pray. Father, I do thank you for being so good, so merciful. I thank you for righteousness as well. I thank you that I know that when I come to your home in heaven to spend all of eternity with me, with you, Father, that there will be no sin. There will be no shame. There will be nothing that is evil of any kind because you have to be righteous. But you give everyone opportunity to be accepted as children of God if they'll just believe in the name of Jesus, if they'll repent of their sins and let Jesus' blood cover their sins for all of eternity. Oh, Father, I thank You for the love that You pour out for us. Help us to be Your obedient children. Help us not to take for granted the things that You do for us, how much You provide for us, how much that You want to bless us, that You would want us to be known as children of God. Oh, Your grace is so outstanding. I just can't fathom it. Thank You for Your love, God. Thank You for pouring it out upon us. Help us to be Your children that will draw others to You. And we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen.